Yeah. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mudit. So, uh, Dr. Mudit Tyagi is a senior vitreo retina consultant and a UVI specialist who is working at LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad. And he'll be talking to us, he'll be presenting a case of ocular toxoplasmosis. All right, so good afternoon. And first of all, let me thank AIOC and the chairs of this session for giving me a chance to speak on ocular toxoplasmosis. Now, if you look at it, how does the ocular toxoplasmosis lesion usually present to our clinics? It will present as a necrotizing yellowish unifocal usually lesion with an ill-defined border, more commonly at the posterior pole. And most of the times toxoplasmosis ends up being a clinical diagnosis. So you can easily identify it just on the basis of a good clinical evaluation. And that's where the beauty of this disease lies. Most of the times it's a clinical diagnosis. And this is a disease which you can diagnose in your clinics easily without resorting to too many investigations. So it's the most common cause of infectious retinitis, most common cause of actually a unifocal necrotizing retinitis and a membrane vitritis. So whenever you see a patient with extensive vitritis, three of the most common differentials usually end up being toxoplasmosis, acute retinal necrosis, and sometimes endogenous endophthalmitis. So if you see dense vitritis, significant vitritis with a single yellowish sort of a lesion which you can discern underneath that vitritis, your diagnosis kind of becomes clear. You are dealing with a toxoplasmosis lesion over here. Can happen in immunocompetent as well as compromised host, frequently involves macula, no consistent direction of spread can have an associated inflammatory response. If you look at the OCT findings of it, you can find neurosensory detachments, basilar layer detachments. And also clinically, you will see arterial plaques or sheathing and we'll come to that later on. Apart from that, you can also see an anterior segment involvement with pigmented KPs and AC cells. So remember the dictum retinitis is infectious unless proven otherwise. So any case of retinitis, be it toxoplasma or for that matter, anything else, unless and until you have proven otherwise, you usually presume it to be infectious. One more very important clinical clue in toxoplasma cases is a pattern of recurrence. The recurrence usually occurs at the edge of an old pre-existing scar. So if you see a scar and you see a retinitis lesion adjacent to it or at the edge of it, think of it as being an ocular toxoplasma. Now this is one important clinical clue which one of my teachers, Dr. Avinash, had once shared, which is reactivation from the center of a scar. TB lesions usually reactivate from the center of a scar. Toxoplasma lesions reactivate from the edge of a scar. And that's one very clean, classical clinical clue to differentiate between these two lesions. So let me in the interest of time just quickly go on to a case. So this was one patient who was referred to our clinic, was diagnosed as acute retinal necrosis, treated with systemic antivirals at the time of presentation. When the patient came to us, you can see this triangular necrotizing sort of lesion in the periphery. But apart from that, look at this clue. The patient had a pigmented scar adjacent to it. So pigmented scar with a retinitis lesion adjacent to it, clue towards this being a toxoplasma. We treated the patients on lines of ocular toxoplasmosis. This is how the patient's lesion started resolving after starting the patient with Bactrim DS. The margins became much more well-defined over here. The lesion started resolving. This is how the lesion was at three weeks time. Visual equity improved and the lesion completely regressed over a period of time. Moving ahead, one more question that comes is what is chirelis vasculitis? That's a sign which has been often described in association with toxoplasma. And basically, it's an intravascular accumulation of plaques on the endothelium of vessels adjacent to a retinitis lesion. So you see a retinitis lesion over here and you see these plaques adjacent to the retinitis lesion. That is chirelis vasculitis. While it can be seen in some other UI entities also, it's a sign which is very classically and commonly associated with a toxoplasma lesion. So you see these lesions, you see a retinitis lesion, again your diagnosis kind of becomes clear that you are dealing with toxoplasma. In terms of what's the role of serology, IgG, IgM do not actually hold much of a value. Like I said, it's a clinical diagnosis, but a negative IgG generally discards the possibility of this being a toxoplasma. In children, IgM assumes importance because in children any titer is significant. And if IgM toxo is positive, usually these eyes respond better to oral rather than intravitreal treatment. In terms of treatment, what are the common agents which are available? The ones which we very commonly use are pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, or a trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole combination, along with clindamycin. Steroids also have an important role in toxoplasma, not only for anterior uveitis or the anterior manifestation where you may use topical steroids, but also oral steroids. But the important point to note is do not stop your antiprotozoal therapy before oral steroids. So start concurrently along with antiparasitic drugs, stop where the retinitis lesion becomes well circumscribed. 
Periocular steroids usually are contraindicated in these cases because sometimes they can lead to a severe necrotic disease. So how long does the treatment continue? You continue it for 6 weeks and usually you stop steroids at 4 weeks and we usually continue Bactrim DS for 2 more weeks after stopping off your systemic steroids. One more common question is what is the role of intravital therapy? Now, intravital clindamycin has been shown to be effective in treatment of toxoplasma but where we do end up using it commonly? In eyes which involve the fovea or fovea sparing, fovea involving lesions, immunocompromised, if there is any systemic contraindication in pregnant patients. So clindamycin 1 mg per 0.05 to 0.06 ml along with DEXA can be given over here in these cases. Al along with that like I said in immunocompromised patients if you have toxoplasma, I will just take 10 more seconds continue heart and continue maintenance dose once every day for a longer duration. So thank you so much for your patient listening and I would just take this opportunity to also invite you to the next USI meeting in Abu Dhabi. Please join us in Abu Dhabi for that and thank you once again. Thank you Dr. Mudit for the overall view of toxoplasmosis. I would like to ask one, suppose if the patient is allergic to sulfur which is commonly we use in treating toxoplasmosis, what will be your preferred drug of choice? So there are other agents also which have been shown to have efficacy but if it's a allergic to sulfa, azithromycin and clindamycin are options. Alternately, you can treat these patients very conveniently with an intravital clindamycin injection. So that also works very well in these cases. So how frequently you give the interval between the injections? Usually the our treatment interval of at least one week before two injections, before the next injection and usually most of the lesions do respond within two to three injections completely. Thank you. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. As Dr. Mudit said, we make diagnosis based on the clinical presentation, serology, or in rare immunocompromised cases, the molecular diagnostic can play a role to confirm the diagnosis. We need to start antitoxo, followed by steroids, stop the steroids and antitoxo to be continued. That will be the reason for treating toxoplasmosis cases. We'll move on to the next. Also clindamycin, intervitral clindamycin works very well, especially in recurrent cases. So cases which are recalcitrant or where you feel phobia is threatened, then don't be hesitant to start intravitreal clindamycin. Thank you. 